All righty. Well, welcome, friends. Thank you for joining us on this lovely Monday evening. My name is Megan Woodfield, and I'm a specialist in the Office of Health Promotion, and we are so excited to have you all here for our prevention panel. This is kind of our kickoff event for Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Month, so very, very excited to have you all here uh, a couple of just kind of groundkeeping things. Uh, please make sure that you are on mute if you are not talking. If you would like to ask an anonymous question, that link is in the chat. And just thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our panel members for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. As I said before, my name is Megan Woodfield, but I am not here on my own running this show. I have a wonderful colleague with me, John Hill, also in the office from Health Promotion, and he is going to talk to you all a little bit about what we do over here. So, John, I will pass it to you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Hi, everyone. My name is John Hill, and I use he, him pronouns. I am also a Health Promotion Specialist in the offices of the Dean of Student Life. Um, so yeah, so health promotion empowers all Aggies to embrace a culture of holistic well-being that fosters their personal, professional, and academic success. So our services uh, focus on a wide variety of topics, uh, everything from fitness and nutrition to stress relief, sleep, uh, and sexual health to interpersonal violence and alcohol, other drug education. So although our focus on this uh, presentation is going to be on interpersonal violence as it relates to the, um, to the content uh, or to consent, and then Yes, sorry. As it relates to consent, uh, how that our office provides presentations on all these topics, um, as well as one on one consultations and opportunities for students to get involved on uh, peer educators uh, and, or, and or student assistants. So uh, I will pass it back off to Megan to explain the purpose for this panel. Thank you, John. So yes, we cover a lot of things in health promotion, consent, violence prevention, wellness, all kinds of good stuff. But we are here today to really look at what domestic violence is, how it affects folks in our community. And we have a wonderful panel of experts who interact with students in all kinds of different capacities. So before we get into it, I want to give not to say a vocabulary lesson, but just go over some terms that are often associated with this type of violence, as I know they can be a little bit confusing. So domestic violence, when we refer to that, we're really talking about violent or aggressive behavior in a home that relates to physical harm. So these are going to be things like bodily injury, assault, but also creating the fear of those things. Intimate partner violence, which can often kind of be confused for that, does include domestic violence, but also goes into broader categories to include things like sexually based violence, financial, emotional, psychological, there's a lot more components that are there. And then dating violence, it's similar to IVP, but that's really going to focus more in minors. Now, a quick disclaimer, as you probably have guessed from just our introduction, we are going to be talking about different ideas and concepts that relate to violence this evening. And that's not always the most comfortable thing. So I encourage everyone who is here, anyone who is watching this after we post, please utilize self-care and do what's best for you in order to help make this content a little bit easier. We're going to have links to a lot of resources that you can chat with if any kind of negative feelings stir up. But just know that you have a lot of support around us and we want to make sure that you're taken care of. Now that we've gotten through all that, I think it's about time we met our panelists. So I will toss that over to John and let all of our friends introduce themselves. Yes, thank you, Megan. So we have our first panelist that I will introduce is uh, Cassie Medlin, uh, and she is from Scotty's House. Would you like to say anything, Cassie? Howdy, everybody. Thanks for having me. I am Cassie Medlin, the Education and Outreach Coordinator from Scotty's House. We are the Child Advocacy Center for the Brazos Valley, where we are providing safety, healing, and justice to kiddos who have been you know, victims of abuse that includes either witnessing domestic violence or domestic violence themselves. And I'm also Biden Texas Aggie class of 2002. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. The next uh, panelist that we have is Kylie Murray, and she is from the Texas A&M Civil Rights and Equity Investigations. 
Yeah, howdy. My name is Kylie Murray. As John said, I'm a, a case manager here at the Department of Civil Rights and Equity Investigations, often referred to as the Title IX office. My office often deals with complaints or reports that come in from individuals who are students, faculty, and staff members um, on a wide variety of different discrimination topics, including things like sex-based violence, and we fall just uh, domestic violence under that category. So I'm really happy to be here and talking about these important things. Thank you. And our next panelist is Dr. Mame Coleman uh, from the Texas A&M Counseling and Psychological Services. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Mama Coleman. Um, I am a psychologist over at Counseling and Psychological Services. What we do is provide mental health services to our students, um, including individual therapy, group therapy, workshops, outreaches, um, and any mental health service related requests that we get from the student body. And I'm happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, our next panelist is uh, Lori Charles, and uh, she is from the Texas A&M uh, College of Nursing. Hi, I'm happy to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Lori Charles. I'm a clinical assistant professor within the College of Nursing uh, within the Center of Excellence in Forensic Nursing. And so two years ago, the Board of Regents named our Center of Excellence in Forensic Nursing a center. And so what we do is uh, collaborate with state agencies, specifically the Attorney General's Office, to provide education and training for forensic nurses. So for those registered nurses who would like to take care of patients who experience violence. So we work with partners like Scotty's House and Cassie to make sure that the nurses know how to best care for patients who experience violence children who experience violence, who maybe have experienced violence or who have witnessed violence. So we will uh, help nurses respond across the entire lifespan. My background is in pediatric forensic nursing. I ran a forensic nursing program in San Antonio for approximately 16 years. And then uh, five years ago, I moved into academia. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Sergeant Jennifer Enloe, and she is from the Texas A&M University Police Department. Howdy, everybody. I'm Sergeant Jennifer Enloe, as you said. I've been with the department since 2008, started my career in patrol, and then in 2017, moved over to be a patrol supervisor. And in January, I moved into the community services unit where I now supervise this. And what we do is go out in, in this current role is provide education uh, to all over all kinds of topics, this being one of them. Um, so for many years, I was out in the field taking these types of cases and sitting at the hospitals and uh, being with victims and uh, suspects and all kinds of other things. And so now my job is to educate the public on these issues. Thank you. And our last panel, our panelist uh, is Alyssa Jewell from the Twin City Mission Domestic Violence Services. Hi, yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Alyssa Jewell and I work as the Prevention and Outreach Specialist for Twin City Mission Domestic Violence Services. So we provide counseling and emergency shelter and legal advocacy, case management, um, free of charge to all of the members of the Brazos Valley, including all seven counties. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Part of my job is spreading awareness about what a healthy relationship can look like and noticing when there are unhealthy relationships or abusive relationships. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, all of our panelists for introducing themselves. Uh, and now, once again, gonna pass the baton back over to Megan. Wonderful, yes. Thank you all so much for being here. It looks like we've had some friends join us since we got started. So just know that in our chat, there is an option to ask anonymous questions to our panelists. You can do that at any point during the time here together. So please feel free to utilize that. But I'm gonna get us started with our first question. So my lovely panelists, in your work, how do you see domestic violence impacting college students specifically? I can start us off if you want. So 
a lot of times when we receive these reports, um, they often come from faculty members or other members of the community who see a student who might be, you know, struggling in courses, um, being in a situation that might include domestic violence can take a lot of time and energy away from students. Um, and so they end up having the majority of the facets of their life impacted. So a lot of times when people think of domestic violence, it's kind of what you were alluding to earlier, Megan, where people think of more intimate sexual relationships. Um, but here at a and we also categorize platonic roommate relationships as domestic violence, if there's any type of violence involved. And so a lot of times when students move in with their friends or um, with a stranger, if they're an underclassman, they don't really anticipate this type of behavior to happen. And so when it does, um, just being aware of that it's happening can, like I said, really be a stressful situation for them. It's not something you expect to get, get into ever, so. Wonderful, thank you, Kylie. Would anyone else like to share from kind of their lens of how they see this impact? Sure, oh, sorry, Alyssa, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think nationally with the statistics that we do know and how they parallel our community, we know one in three adolescents experience dating violence, um, one in four women and one in nine men. But then there's also the statistics specifically for college students where 30% of them have reported some sort of dating violence. So I think it's important for college students to understand the different levels of interpersonal violence and know that it's not just getting physically assaulted, but there's so many other things that also make a relationship abusive that takes that toll on their mental health and their ability to do school. That's exactly what I was going to say, and it can significantly impact all aspects of their life, but def definitely their academic life, and just being able to be present to learn the impact and trauma on the brain's ability uh, to learn is is massive, and I would probably say immeasurable. I'm going to take a completely different, I guess, approach and say my job as education outreach coordinator is, you know, educating the community and whoever will listen to me as it pertains to some very hard subjects. And so I am always very encouraged, especially from the younger population, college age and below, that they are willing to educate themselves on the statistics and listen and have these conversations and jump on. I mean, even the two decades, you know, since it's been since I was a student, I don't remember any type of these conversations or any of this, you know, SARC putting out stuff and, you know, students, you know, coming to, you know, and volunteering. I didn't know about a child advocacy center until I started, you know, almost started working there. Um, it was well into my 30s. And so knowing that there are so many students who, and again, I'm talking to nursing students and medical students and education students, because, you know, teachers are on the front lines with these kiddos sometimes. Um, that they are not only willing to learn about the huge problem that domestic violence and child abuse, you know, how it plagues our um, society, but they are willing and called to act, whether it is going into a profession to help these, you know, people and children, and um, or it is just having a conversation and knowing where to go and the resources available. I, again, I'm always encouraged by, you know, being able to listen to such a hard subject for sure. I would say um, from a, the mental health provider perspective, at least over at CAPS, we find that a lot of times students who come with um, DV or intimate partner violence related concerns aren't aware that that's what's happening until, you know, we kind of get into processing some of the experiences that they're talking about and highlighting that, okay, well, this relationship isn't just weird, it's actually abusive. Um, you know, and sometimes they may not really recognize the ways that it's impacting their relationships with themselves, with other people, impacting their ability to do school, like you mentioned, Alyssa. Um, so it's typically the, you know, I'm having trouble focusing and I'm not motivated and I don't really enjoy going home and I don't really enjoy hanging out with my partner and then speaking a little bit more and finding out, you know, what's going on. 
I also wanted to add, and I think Dr. Coleman could even add more onto this, but when you're in a high stressful relationship where you're constantly in that fight or flight, or you're constantly walking on eggshells, it's very hard to focus. It's very hard to switch your mind onto a subject like school or even friends. And so I feel like that's just another way that college kids get isolated in this situation is like mentally getting isolated. Wonderful thoughts. Thank you all so much for sharing. And I think John has the next question for us. Yes, and I know that Dr. Coleman had just started that to, to shift the conversation, but a lot of the things that we were that you all were talking about in the beginning was about the statistics and such. But leading us into our next question, and like I had mentioned, Dr. Coleman started the conversation, is what are the psychological, uh, social, or emotional behaviors to look out for uh, that may indicate someone is an experiencing domestic violence? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I do want to preface what I'm about to say that everybody experiences it very differently and people will show it very differently. And so maybe for one person, the, the signs that you may notice is that they're isolating a lot from people that they used to enjoy. Um, they're maybe losing interest in things that they used to enjoy. They may be coming up with a lot of excuses that don't tend to make sense about why they're missing out on things why they can't hang out, why they can't go places, why they can't speak to certain people. Um, for other people, you may notice sort of an overcompensation. Um, so what I mean by that is maybe pouring themselves a lot into another area of their lives that doesn't necessarily fit who they are as a person. Um, and then there's the classic science of, you know, unexplained bruises or wearing clothing that don't match the weather type, um, being fearful when speaking about one's partner or one's relationship or not wanting to divulge information, you know, about what's going on in a relationship or being quick to excuse certain behaviors um, that on a personal level don't really make sense or match well with what we'd consider a healthy relationship. Uh, so those are some typical signs of someone who is in a potentially abusive relationship. But again, um, it's not a one size fits all. Um, and with, with emotional abuse, it can be really hard to tell because sometimes it's hard to recognize that you are experiencing emotional abuse. Um, and with financial abuse too, it can be really difficult because we don't have a lot of conversations. So someone thinking that, you know, their partner is being helpful by creating a budget for them and encouraging them to stick to a budget, encouraging them to show their receipts, they may process it as, oh, my partner is helpful, but really that could potentially be abusive, um, financially abusive behavior. Yeah, and I would also say I've seen students who try to avoid going home at all if they come to campus. And so, um, like Dr. Coleman was saying, with really pouring yourself into another area, whether that be academics or extracurriculars, um, finding a reason not to go home um, or finding ways to stay on campus where they might feel safe um, or somewhere else in the community where they might feel safe um, can also be a really big sign. So if someone's hanging out with you more than they normally do in a way that is kind of escalated, that might also be a sign the same way that isolating oneself could be as well. I think following up on what Dr. Coleman and Kylie said, distinct behavior changes, you know, things that are out of the norm for that person, um, you know, I'm thinking of an example of somebody that is typically incredibly put together um, and then starts not having the same presentation as they previously had. I mean, it, it could be I was up all night and I was studying. It could be stress in your relationship. It could be a million things. But um, if we see those kinds of things in, in our friends and colleagues, ask what's going on. Maybe there's something that we could do to, to help before it gets to the point of significant physical violence. And to add on to that, I think also noticing signs um, of your friends or your colleagues um, and how their relationship or how their partner is treating them. And so like how we've touched on isolation, if their partner doesn't like any of their friends and they are constantly saying things like, 
um, why do you hang out with them? They don't like me, I don't like them, trying to get you to go away from those friends. I think as a peer to someone, noticing that happening is very important because then you can take a step in and be like, well, why don't we all hang out together? Or why does he only wanna hang out with you by himself kind of thing? Um, just opening the conversation from like a peer perspective of being like, hey, not like necessarily, I don't like your boyfriend or I don't like your girlfriend, but entering into the conversation of, I don't know if I like the way that they're treating you, like let's talk about it um, and recognizing it in your peers. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for your thoughts on that. And, you know, we've talked about some things to look up for in some behaviors, but even noticing those, you know, there's, there's often some resistance to kind of reaching out and asking for help, whether that's, you know, internal pressures, external things. So I, I want to ask, what are some of the greatest barriers, whether they're individual, social, organizational, systematic, that you have witnessed in your own work that have kind of kept survivors from being able to seek out the help that they're needing? Uh, I think there's significant anxiety and stress around, I love that person and I don't want that person to get in trouble. I want that person to get the help that they need, but I'm also unsafe and I'm not okay. And uh, I think another, the, the second biggest thing I see is, um, not knowing what services are available and what the laws are around, um, you know, roommate uh, abuse and, and that kind of stuff. That's what I see a lot of in the college community as it's not just an intimate partner that could be abusive and there are services available for people that are in, you know, households, including roommate households. To add on to that, I definitely think the lack of knowledge around resources really affects the ability to walk away, especially if you're financially already in that financially dependent situation. If you don't have the funds or if you don't have the correct documentation to walk away, it's a big barrier. I think also touching on the fact that um, a woman or a victim is 70% more likely to be murdered when she walks away from a relationship. That's when you're ripping that power and control right out from under the batterer. And that is the most dangerous time for that victim um, safety wise. So I think keeping that in perspective of fear is a major reason why women and victims together just don't walk away. Yes, I think on average, you know, a victim will try and leave their abuser seven times. And that's because, you know, perception wise, well, you know, they're just hurting. If they're hurting you, why don't you just leave? Okay, well, we're trying or having a victim pick up their entire life, restart a job, relocate if they have children, you know, put them in different schools um, potentially and just completely, I mean, get it out of their apartment, get a house. I mean, completely restart their lives within, I mean, what, the clothes on their back, maybe uh, some money if they have some in their pocketbook. Um, so it's huge, you know, financial steps. And we've seen, you know, low, or at Scotty's house where the, you know, abuser will kind of hold the children, at, you know, dangle them in front. Like if you leave, I'll hurt the children or, you know, I'll do whatever I'm doing to you and I'll do it to the children. Um, so in order to keep the children safe, they stay in these um, abusive relationships. So there's, you know, huge barriers um, because they don't know where to go as far as going back to not knowing the resources and financial um, and individual costs. Because like Alyssa said, um, yeah, what is it within 48 hours, you know, after you leave, that's kind of the most dangerous um, point for a victim um, to try and leave their abuser. Yeah, and I would also add there's a lot of stigma. You're kind of in a catch-22. A lot of victims feel like between if I stay, I'll be ostracized for not picking my whole life up and moving when I don't have the resources or know the resources. And also with a lot of these college students, sometimes moving or removing yourself from that situation means uprooting your whole social life. Um, if you're a first year student, this dorm room might be the only room that you know. It might be the only social group that you know on campus and feel familiar with. Um, moving into student organizations or in with your friends, those might be the only people you know. And so having to recognize and uproot everything could mean losing all those people and losing that familiarity and that comfort. 
And that's a lot of pressure, um, but especially the, the sort of feeling of being ostracized too. I feel a lot of people look at domestic violence as kind of something that once it happens, if you stay, you choose it, which is never the case. Um, and so recognizing that that's not how victims, it's how people feel, but it's not how they should feel. They're not choosing to be in this situation. Um, there are multiple reasons why people can't necessarily leave the first time. Yeah, and I think I would like to add to what you mentioned, Kylie, um, in addition to that shame and social stigma, sometimes there's also some cultural barriers um, that, you know, survivors may face if there is the expectation to, like, make relationships work or get along with parents, especially with domestic violence situations that happen between parents and children, you know, where um, you expect to, to, to make it work or, just bear it out, it can be difficult to negotiate your exit from those relationships as well. I think to touch too on the whole, because we see it a lot of times, um, how Cassie said that um, a woman or a victim is more like most likely to go back seven times, that's the average. Um, we do safety planning as one of our services, which is teaching and like going through a plan of how they can be safe while staying in that relationship. Because if they don't believe that it's safe for them to leave, we take them at their word and we say, okay, we'll work with you here. And so I think you know, having the knowledge that you can plan and it's not just you leave or you don't, there are other options in order to have a safe plan within that relationship still until it is okay for you to go. I think Alyssa brings up a really important point. And, and as a practitioner caring for patients uh, who've experienced violence, that is one of the hardest things to get your mind around because I became a nurse because I wanna help others. And I'm gonna help you whether you want or need my help. And, and that sometimes can be quite difficult for practitioners to go around and to understand that leaving an unsafe environment is a process and it's not a destination. It's going to take time and it's not your timetable as that practitioner, it is the person's timetable. So I like Alyssa, thank you for that point that um, we are going to meet them where they are and we're gonna provide as much education as we can so that they can make the best decision. Because when they say, I'm going to get hurt, if I leave, we believe that. And we go, okay, what can we do? What things can I do to help you so you can prepare to leave? Um, so you have the resources that you want to need when you choose to leave and when is the best time and way for you to leave? All of you brought up some really amazing, amazing points, and um, and and thank you, thank you for that. That was really, really great uh, and really impactful. Uh, moving on to our next question, um, our theme for Domestic Violence Prevention and Awareness Month 2021 uh, programming is resilience. Could you talk a bit about the intersection of mental health and domestic violence, and how someone who has experienced domestic violence or supported someone through that experience could practice resiliency? I'll go again. Uh, <laughs> so I think one of the one of the things that Alyssa was touching on was that safety planning aspect. Um, I know UPD, their victims advocate, also can help with safety planning, and same with College Station's police's victims advocate. And so I think that could be a really big step of resiliency, right? If you're recognizing that there might be a problem and reaching out to try to find a way to maintain your safety, um, even if you if if it makes you feel more comfortable, like you're safer every day, that'll impact how you live your life. If you're a student, it might make it so you feel more comfortable focusing on class or going to class, knowing that you have things in place. And so I think those are really good options when it comes to thinking of ways to be resilient when you're experiencing something like this. I do think even from, you know, the kids and the parents that we help is 
not blaming themselves. I think so much as part of the process, once they're on the path to healing and justice is what could I have done differently? You know, when could I have stopped it before I ever let it get this far? Or, oh my gosh, I let it get this far. It's my fault. And um, we see it all and helping them through that and to where they are in a place where they know that it's not their fault and they're not, you know, blaming themselves um, is kind of a huge part in their resiliency and their healing process. Touching on what Cassie just said, um, the perspective change is a big part of what we teach when we are talking about resilience is changing your kind of what she just said, like changing it. So it's not your, you don't believe it's your fault and you have this swap on perspective. We also have um, goal setting, which is a big part of resilience. And that can be a small goal, like how Kylie had said, like going to class and turning in your assignments, setting those small goals to get through whatever situation you might be going through helps build up those stronger walls for yourself. Um, I think also healthy thinking, um, that's like kind of what we lump it all into is with the perspective change, is just thinking about things from a healthier perspective and a self-discovery kind of perspective of learning about yourself and figuring out the situations that you're going through, how you can better yourself through those situations and then knowing that you can get through them. And I think too, from a helper perspective, you know, recognizing that there is um, only so much that a person can do um, in short of actually making a decision for somebody. And sometimes that is hard to, you know, kind of grasp. I know that when I work with clients who are in relationships that are not very great, sometimes I have to catch myself of like doing everything I can to get them to be or like doing everything I can to get them to like recognize that this is a cycle. So um, a way or an aspect of re resilience that I have come to terms with is recognizing that I'm a helper and not the one making the decision. And sometimes that can be really helpful in minimizing burnout or minimizing becoming overly enmeshed in that situation so much so that it's impacting my own mental health. That's, that's, a, that's, a, very, that's a very great point. Um, Dr. Coleman. Um, and Sergeant Enloy, I saw that you had unmuted. Did you did you want to say something? No, they kind of summed it up already for what I was going to say. I think a lot of people just experience like from the calls that I've taken and the victims that I've been out with and the suspects that I've arrested and things that associate with this is that people just don't. They're so worn down by the person that's doing the abusing, whether that's mentally or physically it, it doesn't matter i actually see it more in the people who are mentally abused sometimes than i do the physical because the mental usually lasts for so long i took a case where it stemmed from um high school and moved over to college and it had been going on for years and the person was finally financially dependent on the other person and to just to know that this is going on in front of parents, in front of other people, and it's still just happening and how worn down that victim was, is it's crazy to me to see how that affects somebody. They just, they lack the common, you know, like we all know to go take a walk or to do something for ourselves, no matter how big or small it is, buy something for ourselves or something like that. But the people that experience this they've lost all of that. All of that is gone because someone has taken that from them, whether it be emotional or physical. So it's just really important to, I think, educate and empower young people. And well, it doesn't matter what age to empower them that they know that they can do things for themselves. And it's okay to feel good about doing that for yourself. I think that's a lot of the problem when we see abuse is that they're just, they're just so out of it that they, they don't remember those small things. So thinking about like taking that next step, so taking the, the step to to seek services and to seek like to start that healing journey, what does the healing process look like for someone who has experienced domestic violence? And this is a little bit of a target targeted question. I will just I'll say this. Um, specifically, um, Dr. Dr. Coleman, Cassie, and Alyssa, if you wanted to, to, to talk about this, but all of you can say something if you'd like. I'll go first because again, I'm we normally deal with children. So, you know, our you know, people we help is um 18 below and their family members. 
So for a child um, who has witnessed domestic violence or been a um, victim there of the actual physical assault, once a report has been made to um, either law enforcement, CPS, or both, they come to Scotty's house for a forensic interview and or a forensic medical exam if they have not been to Scott and White for one already. Um, and so where the forensic interviewer can listen to the child's story, get it in a child-centric, age-appropriate or developmentally appropriate manner, they tell us their story, and then we have advocates on staff that can get them um, hooked up families with any other additional resources in town, many of them represented here, in case they need rent assistance because they have picked up and moved out, you know, elsewhere, in case they need to buy groceries, because 43% of our kiddos last year were hurt by a parent or caregiver, some of them a domestic violence um, you know, situation or scenario. Um, and a lot of those are single income families. And when that person goes away, hopefully through justice, you know, those, pe those families still have to buy groceries, you know, pay rent or a mortgage, put gas in their car. And so our advocates are on staff to get them aligned with any other resources that they may need. Um, and then making referrals to counseling, which we provide in-house or do referrals out of house where, um, on the forensic side, you know, the interviews, the medical exams are normally the kiddos. With the counseling side, there is no threshold of age because child abuse, domestic violence, of course, affects, affects the entire family unit. And as long as they are non-offending, they can receive services for us, um, from us. Um, and so, because we unfortunately do see a lot of domestic violence, intergenerational abuse, where you have a mom who has brought her child you know, for a forensic interview, um, and then they're in counseling. And not only is, you know, the daughter or the, you know, child going through counseling because they were abused, mom or parent is going through counseling because they were abused by the same person. And so now, you know, it never spoke up, never said anything. So they're going through their own guilt, you know, for never speaking up while trying to also process their own trauma um, with our counselors and stuff like that. So, that is from a child's perspective, again, because that is who we um, see and treat and help. I would say um, the healing process for most of the victims that we see, um, it's very different depending on the situation of that specific victim. No two healing processes look the same, the same way that no red flags in one person looks the same. Um, but I definitely think the lack of self-esteem that is in most victims because in an abusive relationship they take away that esteem um, through all of the different tactics um, and so i think definitely um, a victim that has to rebuild their self-esteem is a big part of the healing process and re remembering their self-worth and what they do deserve in a relationship and understanding and coming to terms that it's not their fault i think is a big part of the healing process regardless of your situation but I would also say like how we were talking about resilience and like building that resilience. I think that can kind of go across the board as well for victims is they have to rebuild up that resilience and knowing that through the face of that adversity that they made it through. And if they have kids, like what Cassie was saying, like that counseling that they both go through is so important. And we do counseling here as well. And I think that's a major part of um, healing is talking to somebody and coming to terms with that it's not your fault, that you didn't cause this upon yourself and that you are strong enough to get through it. Um, so for over at CAPS, we work with adults or um, people about the age of 18. Um, we can work with people, I think 17, depending on what the situation is. Um, but typically, because over at CAPS, we are mandated reporters, but we also have a certain um, level of confidentiality in terms of what we do report. Um, we do have to report all incidents of um, abuse or assault um, at the time that the person was a CAPS, um, an a and student, sorry. So if it happened prior to them being an a and student, then that's not something that we are required to report. But if it's regardless of wherever they are, as long as they were enrolled as a and students. And even with that reporting process, we are allowed to report confidentiality confidentially because of the nature of our job. So we are not required to, you know, say the person's name, say what happened, um, 
or like give explicit details of what happened. Um, a, a lot of our healing work is focused on empowering the survivor and making the decision that they feel is best for them, um, providing them space to process what it is that has happened however they want to. Um, some people talk about it, some people don't talk about it. Um, some people will you know, go into as much detail, some people go very little into detail. So, supporting whatever decision that they're making and um, connecting them with resources that are available on campus and within the community. Thankfully, we do have um, a case referral coordinator that helps students get access to other on-campus and off-campus services that they might need. Um, and we're not required to make um, a police report um, in the in the way that other offices might again because of the nature of the services that we we provide and you know kind of the nature of our work in terms of ethical and legal requirements um, so a lot of focus is on the person and the individual what they need um, also thankfully in a um, intimate partner violence situation if the couple is wanted couples therapy as long as there is active form of violence going on, we are unable to provide couples therapy because that is actually counterintuitive and may exacerbate the situation. So if there is, you know, concerns or suspicions of abuse in a relationship, we're not able to see the couple unless, until that is cleared up and that situation is a lot less volatile. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Does uh, anything, anyone else want to share anything before we move on to our next question? Or you, Megan? Okay, so we, we've talked a lot about different resources and trying to get people to understand the resources that are available and kind of what those processes look like. So I would love if y'all would kind of share if someone was coming to your department, your organization, uh, your office that was experiencing domestic violence, what can they expect in terms of the process of your service and what you have to offer? What, what does that look like of someone walking in who's kind of needing assistance? I can start us off. So at DVS, um, we do multiple different intakes with um, our clients. And so you can call our 24 hour hotline. And if you are in need of emergency services, then we will do an intake with you and you can come to our emergency shelter. Um, like I said before, we have all seven counties free of charge to any citizens like within those counties. Um, and so it's based on where you stayed the night before. And so if you stayed in College Station, our services can apply to you. Um, so when they come here, they get to decide if they want the direct services, which is the emergency shelter and um, going in person. But then we also have the non-direct services, which is our counseling, our legal advocacy, our case management, our LAP program. We also do, um, like I said, the safety planning and we help with um, protective orders. And so if you are in need of any of those types of services, you can simply call us and one of our case managers will do an intake with you where they ask you the basic questions and then our services are free to you to use. So over at CAPS, um, our services are free for all students. Um, so because we're not required to report in the typical way that other offices are, um, we off the bat go over our reported duties with the client, letting them know that we are required to make an anonymous report as long as the incident happened at the time that they were a student, but we're not required to like, you know, make them report to the police or make them go to the hospital. Um, so a lot of our work is connecting them to campus resources. So we might send them over to student life, we, we might send them over to um, DPS if that's something that they want to pursue. Um, and we basically get them connected to the services that they need for whatever they choose to, um, whatever route they choose to go and letting them know sort of the limits of our confidentiality. The only time that we would be required to share information um, is if there's a matter of safety. So if there's any suicidal ideation or there's concerns that they may harm other people, or if it's a situation where children um, or elderly adults are at risk of harm. 
But other than that, it's pretty confidential information, pretty, very, very confidential services. I think I kind of went through our processes um, as Scotty's house but there has to be an open investigation. It's not like a walk-in um, type situation by any means, but once that report has been made to either CPS or law enforcement, um, child abuse, domestic violence, um, they come to Scotty's house for the forensic interview and or forensic medical exam. And then our advocates will refer them if need be to other resources or to counseling. And then they come um, either in-house um, or out of house for counseling if they want it. Um, they can always come back to Scotty's house, um, you know, if they initially decline services and then they, you know, realize they're in over their head, they can always come back. Our doors never close on our, um, our clients or if kiddos graduate or even their parents graduate out of counseling. And then um, with the, you know, justice system, it's not quick by any means. And of course, um, COVID certainly has just elongated the process. Um, with, you know, trials, maybe if it makes it to trial, um, taking three, four or five years um, in which, you know, if you take a five or six year old who initially came to us, you know, for the forensic interview and the counseling, and then now they're six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 years old, they're in a completely different developmental stage in their life. And obviously having to go to court would be quite traumatic. So we can always bring them back um, to help them work through any anxieties. Um, or they may start dating, um, you know, when they came to us when they were little and then, you know, dating trick or something. So they can always come back or unfortunately, sometimes they are looking for love in all the wrong places and unfortunately re-victimized. Um, we can always bring them back in and our, but our doors never close on our clients and they um services are offered at no charge to them so this so, looks like, oops sorry go ahead lori sorry so um like like i spoke about uh we provide education for nurses who wish to be forensic nurses but i think a little later on i will go through the forensic nursing process so i'll pause on that one This looks a little bit different for police, so it matters whether the call is in progress or the victim is just coming in to report this at a later time. So if this is an in progress call or something that we would go to a call for service for, most likely the offender is or the suspect is going to be arrested because the state of Texas says you shall arrest in um, family violence cases, domestic violence cases, which is roommates and what we're what we're talking about here, boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, all types of couples, it doesn't matter the gender. Um, so that looks a little bit different. If you're talking about something in progress where I have to come into a home or, or a location of any type um, where it's already happened, then we're gonna do our best to separate parties and speak to them. And ultimately the victim would be uh, provided the same type of, of paperwork and information as they would if they walked in a day later, a week later, a year later. Um, they all have the ability to have a pseudonym. So that means basically your name is taken out of any probable cause statements that could potentially be released to anyone. So that, that name stays private. And then we always refer to the person, the victim to our victim's advocate so that they have as many resources available, which kind of entails what all of you all do so that she can reach out to uh, everybody that that would need to assist that person and including court cost if, if that was the situation kind of varies on what's what's happened or the type of case um anywhere from a class c misdemeanor uh, family violence to you know up to the felony assault so it it varies on that but the bottom line is is that the person's name can stay private uh, we can find resources for that person that night. We can help find resources for the person later on if they choose to report it at a later time. So that's kind of what it looks like for us. Unless anybody else has any other specific questions they think I should be pointing out on that. Yeah, and I can kind of talk through what Title IX process looks like. So when we receive a report, um, whether it be from uh, like a UPD report that comes from the police department or a faculty and staff member um, as mandated reporters or um, almost anyone other than student health services or CAPS where all that information is de-identified for us. 
Um, the first thing that we do is outreach to whoever the victim is, or we call them the complainant in our process. Um, that person doesn't have to answer our email. So we're never going to force anyone to talk to us. I always think that's really important. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable. Um, and we totally are accepting of that. Um, we will do outreach three times if we don't hear an answer. So for students, it's an initial email, um, a phone call, and then another email um, saying, if you would like our services, please just let us know by this date. Otherwise, we'll close your case. The nice thing is similarly to uh, what Alyssa and Cassie were saying, our services are offered at any time. So even if we close your case, you can come back to us in a week, two weeks, a year and a half from now, it doesn't matter. Um, we're always willing to open the door and kind of let you talk through what happened and get those resources. After that, we do an intake process that's very similar where we walk over your rights, options, and supportive measures. And those look like things like writing a letter to a professor if you don't feel comfortable talking to them that says the student might need extra support. Um, we also do things like issue no contact directives if, this, if the offending individual is a member of our university community, we can do a no contact directive that says the two of you are to have no conversation with each other through a third party directly, email, social media. Otherwise they'll face some sort of disciplinary action, whether that be termination from employment or expulsion from the university, depending on how egregious the behavior is. Um, those are some things that we offer as well as resource referrals to everywhere uh, like CAPS, uh, Twin City Missions, UPD, um, if they want. So we do that. And then we offer three different options. So you can go through what everyone thinks of when they think of my office, which is a formal Title IX investigation where we're interviewing the victim, the offending individual, um, any witnesses, collecting documents that ends in a hearing. Um, we can do an administrative conference, which is kind of like a mediation meeting where you're allowed to talk through what happened, what the impact of it was on you, and request that they that the other individual do things like take a workshop at CAPS or through health promotions or write you a letter of apology or write up a, a paper about what they learned from the experience, um, as well as do things like maybe they agree to take a semester away from the university or to not ever take classes with you again. Um, we can also move you in this specific case. So if you request to move dorms or um, you want a referral to like student legal services, we can also do that if you need to move from your residence um, to somewhere else. So that's kind of what our process looks like. Um, like I said, it's always voluntary. So people don't have to come in and talk to us. Um, yeah. And Kylie, a, a clarifying question I have for you, because I feel like this is a question I get a lot and a misconception that's out there. Reporting to Title IX is completely separate than reporting to university police or community police, correct? Yes, 100%, absolutely. I will give you the option to report to university police. I'll give you the resources if you want to make um, an official police report. We do, because of something called the Clary Act, have to report everything that we have to university police so that in the case that someone is kind of a threat to the wider health or safety of the community, they can put out those timely warnings, which we always joke is like anything from like those golf carts being stolen to like a sexual assault happening that goes out. So we have to report those. That doesn't mean that it's an official police report. And it's also important to note that um, without an official police report or a police call, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Sergeant Enlow, uh, but neither my office nor UPD will necessarily go with that information to contact the respondent. So my office specifically, we do not contact the respondent unless or until the victim wants us to go and do that, whether to have a conversation with them, give them a notice of investigation or anything like that. And UPD also doesn't do that when we submit our Clary reports to them. It mostly sticks with their Clary team. Um, and unless it is a situation where there's a health or safety threat, they're not going to go out and automatically contact the respondent because they received that information. 
Yeah, we get a lot of reports where the victim does not want us to contact the person that they're reporting about. And even sometimes they won't even provide a name. They just want it documented at that time. And while that doesn't make a lot of sense for law enforcement officers, because we're like, why wouldn't you want to tell us? It, it does for them. And that's really all that matters. If they want it documented, our job is to document it and, and to help them. No matter what the case may be that at the end of the day that's still the reason why we're doing our job is to help other people so we we have a lot of instances like that where where it can be anything from a theft to a sexual assault to a, a violent physical assault um you know in addition to sexual assault so there can be many 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 variations of that and in the state of texas jennifer brought up brought up a great point in the state of texas People who are 18 and older and do not have a disability have the right to have a sexual assault exam, a full sexual assault exam by a, a forensic provider without involving law enforcement. And so say a, a person was sexually assaulted, they can present to the hospital, have a full forensic exam, including evidence collection, have treatment for sexually transmitted infections, any injuries that they have, have photographs taken the entire exam from start to finish. And that evidence is then stored for up to five years. And so that allows that person who's experienced sexual violence, the opportunity to have the evidence collected, save it, and then have five years to decide if they wish to go forward with the case. And if they do, then the forensic nurse provides education on if you choose, you know, tomorrow or four years and 364 days from tomorrow, you want to have this turned into a report, then you would call the law enforcement agency wherever it happened and say, I had an exam and there is evidence. Can you please go get the evidence? And then law enforcement will start the case and begin their, uh, their investigation. But that evidence was kept. And so that's a great option for people who experience violence. They can have that evidence collected immediately and then have time to make the choice if they wanna go forward. Lori, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that actually was my next question um, is, and you've already done a lot, but in case there's anything else you wanna add, uh, could you walk us through for someone who's never heard of a forensic exam before, what that is and kind of what that process looks like? Sure, so first of all, it is trauma-informed. So the people who become forensic nurses or are forensic providers, go to school to be a, a nurse or a physician and or an advanced practice registered nurse. So they already have that education. And this is additional education in how to talk to people who've experienced violence. And so it is trauma informed, number one. And number two, it is patient centered. And so what that means is the patient runs the show. They're the boss. I, I'm not the boss. They get to make decisions and it does not matter I'm smiling at Cassie. If the child is three, they are the boss. And if they say to me, do not touch me, I am not touching them. I will, however, ask questions about how they have come to that conclusion, because it might be that they're scared. They think I'm going to do something to them that they don't want to have done. They think it's going to be painful, what, whatever. I might be able to educate them and continue on the process. But if they are hard stop, no, we are done, then we're done. And today's just not the day. But the good news is we have five days after somebody's experienced a sexual assault or, or think they've experienced a sexual assault, we have five days that we can collect evidence. And so trauma-informed, patient-centered, absolutely not forced. Um, and it does not matter even if the parents say, I want you to do this. We are not forcing a child to have a sexual assault exam or anybody without their consent. And the, um, the fourth one is their significant education. So they have all kinds of education and information while they go through. And the last one is it's extensive. This is probably the most involved physical assessment 
they've ever had in their whole life. And so it's going to take time. And that's not just because I'm really, really slow. It's that I really want to do a great job and I don't want to miss anything. And so they're probably going to be with me for hours. And so for a pediatric sexual assault exam, that is laughing, joking, playing. We run around the room. They get to choose the gown they want to wear. Um, we make body part jokes. We make function of body part jokes. All those things happen in a pediatric sexual assault exam. As a rule, a sexual assault exam does not physically hurt unless that person has injury and I inadvertently touch that injured area. I work really hard to not do that, but it could happen. And I, I warn them, if I hurt you in any way, please let me know and I'll stop immediately. And then when they say, ow, I stop immediately. That's really important. And then for an adult sexual assault exam, again, they run the show. And so that's a detailed head to toe assessment. I check them from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes and everywhere in between that they let me. So when you sign a consent and say, okay, you can do the exam, that doesn't mean I just get to do the exam and you have no say ever again. What that means is every step of the way you can say, I know I signed consent before, but now I'm not, I, I don't want that. Okay. Help me understand why you would not want that. And we can have a conversation. And then if they say no, that means no. And I, if they're okay with me going on, I will continue the exam. So we also address generational abuse, like Cassie spoke about. Um, oftentimes, I've seen children that were sexually assaulted. And when they are brought in by a parent, a parent will say, this happened to me when I was a child and I was not helped. And I, I can't believe this is happening to my kid. And so now we have two people who've experienced violence and they both need services and help right now. And so we will address that. We will provide links to services, which is Scotty's house, um, the Sexual Assault Resource Center. We will do any mandatory reporting that is required. I will never make a report without letting you know I'm making a report. You will always know what's going on when you're in the emergency department with me because you're the boss. Um, I will provide education. And um, that last note I had was the reporting versus not reporting. If it's a child, we have to report, we have no choice. It does not matter if the patient says, I need to go, I'm gonna leave. I, I still have to make that report. Um, but with adults 18 and over, they can choose to have the exam and report it to law enforcement or not report it to law enforcement. And we can walk through that whole process. What I do with a lot of patients is they're like, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, how about if you're okay, we'll do the whole exam. I'll collect evidence. And at the end, you'll decide whether or not you want to report. And sometimes they'll say there was injury and I'll say yes. And they say, okay, can we call the police now? Sure. Or they'll say, I'm just not ready. And that's okay. We'll store the evidence and you can make that decision later. So that's a really long <laughs> explanation, but I felt like it was really important that it does not hurt. It's patient-centered and the patient is absolutely the boss, and we have 120 hours to collect sexual assault evidence in Texas right now. That was extremely wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori, for that explanation. It's, it's something that I feel like a lot of people don't understand all the odds and ends, so I deeply appreciate it. We have a couple more questions, but I wanted to just remind all of our friends who are in the room with us about our anonymous question form. So if you have not submitted questions and you want to ask our panelists while we are here with our time together, please feel free to do so. If we run out of time, we will make sure that they still get your questions and that we put out that information. Uh, but we do have a couple more, so I will toss it back over to John. Yes, thank you, Megan. And actually, I think that the the question that we that we received, that we, okay, anyways, that we received, um, I, I think is a good question, and I think that it's a, it's a valid question for college students. Um, so I'm just going to jump to that question, and then we can come back um, to the the ones that we have structured. Um, so someone had asked uh, in the anonymous questionnaire, 
Um, who should I contact if my friend is being abused but does not want to seek help for themselves? I think it's a loaded question. So one of the things that I always say to do as someone who works at the university is refer them to CAPS. Um, so if someone reports to me saying, I have a friend, I don't want to give their name, they're very hesitant about doing something, um, I always refer them to counseling and psychological services because that gives them an outlet to talk through what's happening, get the resources they need without making a formal report. Because like Dr. Coleman and I were saying earlier, it's de-identified. So they have to say there was a sexual assault with like no other information or there was domestic violence. That gives us the opportunity to have the student kind of talk through what's happening without necessarily doing something about it, even though getting mental health uh, attention is doing something about it for yourself. But yeah, so that's, that's the route I normally take with students who are in that position. I'm gonna say, make sure you're safe first. You, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. So make sure you're safe while you're providing support for your friend um, and, and just be there for them and uh, remind them this isn't their fault. Um, cannot say that enough, that it does not matter what your actions were. It does not mean you deserve to be hurt. Nobody deserves to be hurt and nobody needs to be spoken to in a way that is belittling or, or terrorizing. And, and so exactly be safe and then know, know the resources. And there's also a Brazos Valley domestic violence hotline, as well as a national domestic violence hotline. And I'll drop those in the chat box because when we're talking about 18 plus, a lot of times you just kind of have to let them know what resources are available to them until they are ready to, um, oh, thank you, Becca got it. Um, until they are ready um, to either make the call and act and get away. I was going to say the same thing that Cassie said. It's up to them and you are to there to support them and love them through all of the choices and through all of the relationship. And something I always love to say is um, I'm sure we've all heard of the bucket analogy um, where you have your bucket and it has to be filled in order for you to pour into others. And I believe like a victim going through the situation, like your friend probably has an empty bucket. And so just filling that, putting their self-esteem back into them and showing them that they're worth something more. And what um, Lori had said about it's never their fault. It's no matter what they did, it's not their fault. So I think continuously filling their bucket and providing them those resources and support, eventually like they can get to it, but it has to be their choice to make. Wonderful, thank you all so much. and. Cassie, you perfectly segued into my next question um, with mentioning the domestic violence hotline. We might have some folks who are watching this who are outside of College Station, who are outside of our area. What are some resources? What are some folks that they can get in contact with if they are needing services, but maybe they are outside of kind of the Texas A&M community? So when somebody calls us, that is outside. So we do the seven counties. So that's Burleson, Robertson, Leon, Grimes, Madison, Brazos, and now I'm forgetting one. I always end up forgetting Washington. one. Washington, did you say Washington? Washington, there we go, thank you. So we do those seven counties of Brazos Valley and we do typically get calls from outside of that. And so there's a TCFV handbook that provides a list of all of the shelters nationally. And so when they call the hotline and we aren't able to provide them services, we are able to refer them to another agency in their location to provide those services for them. One of the things that I'll say too, because I know a and a lot of people look at our stuff even if they don't go here, is if you are a collegiate student at another institution, um, every, almost every single college in the United States, except for like three, fall under Title IX. So your university has a Title IX office um, with the Title IX coordinator, who is also responsible and charged with assisting students in the case that they're in a situation that deals with some sort of sex-based 
violence, including domestic violence. And so if you're going through a situation or you have a friend at another university, that Title IX office is a really good resource for you to reach out to. Um, we were, were able to do that with students here too. If someone goes somewhere else or if you're a visiting scholar to refer you back to your home institution's Title IX office, and often our offices can work together in the case that a complainant goes one place and a respondent goes to another. Um, so I always say, if, if you're in the, the demographic, uh, to, to look for your Title IX office. I put a couple of things in the chat. The first one is RAIN, which is the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Um, they know where all the sexual assault services are. And um, Baylor, Scott & White, if, if it is, you are a local person, you have a friend, family um, that experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, anything that is acute um, happened in the last five days, we, we definitely want you uh, to seek health services at the hospital. And that can kind of start the ball rolling for all the other services. Also, we will link with all the other services that that, that person could potentially require. But number one, we want to make sure that they are physically safe and number two, um, healthy. And so that's why we want to have that health assessment first. Thank you. Uh, thank you for putting all of those, those links in the chat. Um, and thank you. Thank you all of our panelists for, um, for, for their answers. Um, and I always want to say too, I appreciate Megan for letting me last or ask the last question. Um, I, I appreciate this honor. Um, and the final question that, that we have for you all is we received this question from students quite a bit um, saying, what can we do to change this or stop it from happening? as well as what are, what are some ways that a person or group could be proactive in changing the culture around domestic violence? Uh, education, <laughs> educating yourself on the signs, education or educa educating yourself on the resources available. Um, education, like at least from my perspective, um, is the best tool that we have um, to stop you know, these large, I mean, with one in three, that's a huge, huge problem um and so we have to educate ourselves it's not just happening you know to this socioeconomic or this class or this you know um demographic it with one in three i mean you know statistically there's what 11 people on this call right now i mean you can do the math statistically we have victims you know on this call right now um so we have to educate ourselves not only on the signs not only on what to look for in victims and in perpetrators, but also where we can find services for these victims when it does happen. That's exactly what I was gonna say too, is you know, participating in this education and knowing where the resources are, just asking that question alone makes me very happy because that makes me think that people already understand there's something that that can be done. So educate, educate yourself, educate others. And um, like Alyssa said, be there to support others, but take care of yourself first, make sure you're safe, and then you can help support others. But just really, there are so many services available, a quick Google search, you can find services near you that, that can be helpful for, for you or others. To go off of that on the education side is, I think, also normalizing the conversation of violence and the intimate personal violence. Um, it's very hush-hush. We're not supposed to talk about it, and it kind of just ruins a conversation when you bring it up. But it's something that is affecting all of us. You can look at the national statistics and the Brazos Valley statistics, and we understand that this is affecting us in our community. So it's something that we need to be talking about and actively working to fix. And I think that you can do that in two main ways. Um, I always say when it's so important for us as peers to recognize it in others, because once you are a victim and you lose that self-esteem and you're isolated and you're financially dependent, it is very hard for you to walk away. But it is very easy for other people looking at you to be able to notice those things and notice that change in your behavior and being able to provide you those resources. And then on the flip side of that, 
coming to terms with your own toxic and personal issues and the trauma that you've endured in your relationships and how that can negatively affect your future relationships and turn that unhealthy. So definitely looking inward and being able to identify your unhealthy behaviors, because we all know that 100% of people commit unhealthy behaviors and 100% of people are victim to it. And so it starts with you and then it starts with everybody else. Yeah, I was also going to say knowing the signs kind of similarly, not just for your peers and the people around you, but like we were talking about earlier, sometimes people are in these situations and they don't recognize that it might be domestic violence until they come and talk to a resource. So knowing the signs also for yourself that like, maybe it's just a platonic roommate who then steals my things or slaps me when they're upset about something, something like that. Just because it's platonic doesn't mean it's not domestic violence and also recognizing the behavior for yourself too to say oh if i saw these behaviors for someone else i would think they were in this situation um a lot of times it takes us kind of reading a definition and saying do you relate to this experience for people to understand that it's happening to them so look out for yourself too um i think that's also very important but also calling out behaviors when you see it if you have a friend who's um, doing some of these, like what Alyssa called toxic behaviors, um, make it so that that's not a cultural norm in your group of friends or group of students that you're in, be able to say, eh, I don't know, I don't think that's very cool, probably shouldn't do that, or refer the people who are to the resources if you have them. And piggybacking off with the conversation about education, um, over at CAPS, we have a workshop called Hashtag Relationship Goals, and it is specifically uh, designed to teach about healthy relationship patterns. So how are we able to identify healthy relationship patterns, healthy relationship behaviors in all types of relationships? How are we able to recognize when we are participating? and the unhealthy patterns and how do we go about rectifying it, you know, teaching us about different communication styles that can help us to resolve conflict in ways that doesn't resort to, to violence or degradation or abuse. Um, so that's a service that we have and it's free for students to take that workshop. You can take it as many times as you need. Um, you can take it and store that information for the future. Um, you know, you can take and share with a friend who might be shy and might not be too sure about clinical services, but I think education is more important, making that education accessible. And Kylie, like you mentioned, just destigmatizing it, normalizing those conversations, creating space for people to talk about these things. I am not a panel member, but I could not help myself if I did not mention that in the Office of Health Promotion, we also have two really wonderful trainings that we offer. One of them is our Green Dot Bystander Intervention Training. So if this conversation has moved you and you want to learn more about how to be that person and step in and say something, if you notice these patterns, uh, that is a free training that we offer. We have three hour long trainings. We have 60 minute overviews. We have 90 minute overviews. We can do them in person, virtual, any kind of thing. So I would definitely recommend those. Uh, our office also coordinates the stand up trauma informed care training. So learning more about how to be empathetic and compassionate and how to just take that into a space and know more in depth about what trauma is and how it affects folks. Um, again, not a panel member, but if, if we're talking about next steps, uh, gotta, gotta let people know what we're doing over here too. Well, thank you for that, Megan. Um, as a honorary panelist for that last question. Um, yeah, and actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss it right back off back to you, so. Alrighty, well, I believe that is all of our questions. So I'm going to just throw out a couple resources here at the end before I wrap us up because I, I wanna make sure that everyone has these. So Becca, if you are ready to toss these in the chat for me, friends, uh, the National Sexual Assault Hotline is 800-656-4673. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is 888-373-7888. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-7233. Uh, 
And another absolutely wonderful resource for education, for connecting to different folks and who can get you a lot of really great content is the One Love Foundation. Uh, so just a couple other resources to leave y'all with aside from the icons, honestly, that we have as our panel members here today. Um, and with that, I am going to start wrapping us up. So I want to thank everyone who tuned into this, whether you're here with us live, whether you're watching this video after we post it onto Facebook, because it's currently down at the moment, uh, for your time and for your dedication to this. I know that this is not always the easiest topic to discuss, but being able to share space and hear from all of these experts in their areas and learn more about what we can do has honestly been very, very inspiring and touching to me. So we'll personally and professionally just thank you all for being here. Um, again, with the shameless plugs, because we got to do one. This is just the first of many events that Health Promotion is doing in honor of Domestic Violence Prevention and Awareness Month, aka DVAM. So please feel free to check out our calendar and see what other things we are doing. We got a lot. It's going to be great. We would love to see you again. And again, to our panelists, just thank you so much for your time and expertise, everything that you do for our students, for our community. Uh, it makes it makes us feel a lot better to know that there are really hardworking people out there who care and who are providing these services. So with that, I'm going to end the recording. Um, if anyone has questions and wants to hang back, please feel free to do so. But other than that, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks and gig'em.